Our uh, first speaker in this morning, morning, well, for us, <laughs> uh, is uh, Carl Hermann Nib. Uh, I believe I don't need to introduce uh, Carl Hermann to this audience. Everybody is aware of his leading research in Lie theory. Well, uh, infinite dimensional Lie groups representation theory and also same groups one of the, our subjects here. And um, well, I thank you, Carl Hermann, for giving us a, a talk in this. Uh, in this meeting. Uh, here, we, here we will speak about uh, geometric aspects of the modular theory of operator algebras. So, Karhaman, it's uh, all with you. Thank you again. <laughs> yeah, thank you. So I'm sharing and I hope that it looks okay for you. So uh, thanks again for the invitation to the, your nice Lee theory series of schools and conferences. So I checked my files and I saw that I was there for the first and the fourth, and this is now the seventh. So uh, I hope you will invite me again for the 10th probably. And I hope that we can do this in presence then and uh, meet in Brazil again. Okay, so what you will see today is some uh, Lie theory, some semi-groups, some geometry. So uh, let me start with a short overview of the talk. So what I will talk about is motivated by um, constructions in the theory of uh, operator algebras that show up in, in quantum field theory. Um, Operator algebras for Neumann algebras are very complicated objects. So my first step will be to reduce this complexity to something more simple, which is encoded in standard subspaces. And then we will take another step and encode standard subspaces in terms of representations, so-called anti-unitary representations of finite dimensional Lie groups in our context. And then from there on, we will see that semi-groups will actually help us to see where the relevant structures lie. And from there, we will move on, on uh, to symmetric spaces and see where we can construct these structures on causal symmetric spaces. Okay, so let me start with some motivation from quantum field theory. So uh, this will be very superficial, but you don't need more to understand the motivation. So the main idea of quantum field theory is that you uh, uh, divide your space time into smaller pieces, which you may think of representing laboratories. And for every laboratory in your space time, you have a certain set of observables and they are combined in operator algebra acting on some Hilbert space. Now, we also want to have a symmetry group acting on the space-time manifold M and uh, having a unitary representation on the Hilbert space. And this process of assigning an operator algebra to the space-time domain should satisfy the corresponding covariance uh, relation. So when you move the space-time domain, you conjugate your operator algebra. <clears throat> Now, what we will see is that among these space-time regions, there are some which are more interesting than others. And they are called sort of test region. That's not a very good name, but just some name. Uh, for those regions for which uh, the setup creates out of more or less nothing, uh, a so-called modular group. So this is a unitary one parameter group. And its interpretation is uh, as the flow of time on this space-time domain O. So in a way, the, the setup creates uh, the flow of time. And this interpretation is due to work by Kohn and Trovelli, mid-90s. And that will play an important role for the geometric constructions. Now, what we want is we want to understand how these modular groups representing the flow of time on such domains 
look like and how we can analyze them in terms of homogeneous basis of, of the groups. Now, the prototypical example in physics is where M is four-dimensional Minkowski space. So its elements are right as pairs, where X0 is the time component, X is the space component. Then the Lorentz form is supposed to be positive on time-like vectors and negative on the space direction. The symmetry group here is the affine Poincaré group. So it consists of space-time translations and the Lorentz group. And there, a typical test domain, so one of these interesting domains, is the so-called Rindler wedge. So you see the condition here is just in the first two components where this relation specifies sort of a right quarter plane. And then uh, you simply take the product with the other n minus two uh, coordinates. So in four dimensional space, this is a quarter plane times R2. So that's typical test region. And the corresponding modular group is represented by the SO11, this one dimensional group acting uh, on the X0, X1 plane. So these are the uh, Lorentz boosts on this plane. Okay, so let's take a look at some more details. I should say, in case there are questions, please interrupt. So I'm happy to answer questions during the talk. So here's some uh, notation. H will be a complex Hilbert space, B of H, the bounded operators. And uh, to say what a von Neumann algebra is, I have to say what the commutant of a set of operators is. So this is denoted M prime. So these are all operators commuting with everything in M. And in these terms, a von Neumann algebra is a star subalgebra of B of H which coincides with its own bicommutant. So this is a closeness condition which uh, singles out the nice operator algebras. So this is stronger than just being norm closed. Okay, for, for Neumann algebra, one uh, studies vectors and what they uh, generate under the algebra. And for that, we will need two concepts. One is that a vector is cyclic. So this means applying the elements of the algebra generates the whole Hilbert space. And there is a dual concept of a separating vector uh, where the image under an operator of the algebra of the vector determines the, the operator. This means that uh, the annihilator of the vector in the algebra is trivial. So, um, yeah, so, so this is, um, we will see that it's easy to find separating vectors for small algebras, and it's easy to find cyclic vectors for large algebras. That's pretty clear. Now, the, the main theorem in the modular theory of operator algebras is the Tomita Takesaki theorem. Um, so, this is a simple version of that. Uh, so if one starts with the von Neumann algebra and a vector which is cyclic and separating, then this already generates additional structure. One part of this structure is a conjugation of the Hilbert space, which is an antilinear isometry, <clears throat> just like complex conjugation on Cn. And the positive self-joint operator, typically unbounded, this is called the modular operator. And these uh, additional structures satisfy these relations. So this is the modular relation between J and delta. Now, when I conjugate the von Neumann algebra with J, what I get is its commutant. So this means that M and M prime are in a very symmetric configuration. And the main point for today is this third relation namely that conjugating with the unitary group that I get by the imaginary exponents of the operator delta, then I get an automorphism group of M. So this preserves the von Neumann algebra M, and accordingly one interprets the, the delta as encoding a 
an automorphism group of the von Neumann algebra. So that's the theorem. Now, it's rather easy to see how you get these operators delta and j. What's hard in the theorem is to verify uh, part two and part three. So um, how do you get these two operators? What you do is you look at the anti-linear map from the dense subspace you get from applying the von Neumann algebra to omega uh, to itself by mapping m omega to m star omega. This is well defined because omega is separating. And then it turns out that this is a closed, dense, a closable operator. And its closure has a polar decomposition, and this produces J and delta. So this means constructing J and delta is elementary functional analysis, but the properties lie, lie deeper. OK, now how do we connect this with quantum field theory? I already said that in quantum field theory, you have families of von Neumann algebras indexed by subsets of uh, space-time, and this assignment is supposed to satisfy certain natural conditions. One is if you enlarge the domain, you enlarge the algebra of observables. The second uh, means that if the domains O1 and O2 cannot exchange signals, so this is uh, contained in this prime notation here, then uh, the corresponding operator algebra should commute. So this is compatible with Heisenberg's uncertainty relation. When, when two events cannot uh, interfere, then the corresponding observables should commute. Um, now, the third point is one also wants a covariance condition for the group. And the group should have a unitary operation on the Hilbert space. We have seen, that, seen this already. Now, the uh, next part is where Tomita Takasaki comes in. So one also wants a unit vector which is fixed under the symmetry group. So one interprets it as a vacuum state of, of the theory. And in these terms, one calls the domain in M a test region if this vacuum vector is cyclic and separating for the corresponding local algebra M of O. And if this is the case, then the Tomita Takasaki theorem uh, provides the, the modular group, the unitary one parameter group. And this is the kind of structure that we want to understand geometrically. So typical problems in this context are Given a homogeneous space of the Lie group G, can we construct quantum field theories on these spaces? In particular, which domains are test regions? And what we prefer in particular is test regions where we can see the modular group in terms of a one parameter group of our Lie group. So we want to realize these modular groups geometrically in terms of our or symmetry groups. Okay. <clears throat> so do we have questions so far? Don't see any, okay. Okay, so the next step is to simplify the uh, situation. We want to reduce this complexity encoded in operator algebras to something simpler. And for that, we use the so-called second quantization procedure. So here, this will be the bosonic or symmetric case. So what is this? Um, if you have a complex Hilbert space, we can consider something like the Hilbert space symmetric algebra. So we take the uh, symmetric powers of the Hilbert space take their direct sum and turn this into a Hilbert space by completing it. Uh, this is called the bosonic Fox space. Now in the zero degree, this is just a one dimensional space and the unit vector there I call omega, like vacuum. Now S1 is the copy of the Hilbert space and the higher, higher symmetric powers are simply more complicated. Um, 
a natural set of generators of this fog space are these sums which looks like look like exponentials but instead of the n factorial factor we take the square root uh, and this is meant to create this relation for the scalar product so two of these generators should have this exponential of the scalar product in the Hilbert space is their scalar product and these vectors generate a dense subspace and they determine the Hilbert space structure on the Fox space. Okay, so what we also have are so-called while operators. So this is an abstract version of the Heisenberg algebra associated to this Hilbert space. So for every element in the Hilbert space, there is a unique uh, unitary operator on the Fox space, which moves the generator corresponding to eta to the generator corresponding to eta minus epsilon. And um, because these two generators have different norms, one has to correct with this factor. And uh, this turns out to specify uniquely a family of unitary operators. So they are more or less like translations up to constant factor. So they generate a nil potent D group represented on, on Fox space. Now we need these operators to construct operator algebras. And what we can do now is we can start with, a, say, a closed real subspace of our Hilbert space H. So H was complex, B is real. And then look at the operator algebra, which is the by commutant of the set of all while operators we get from elements in V. So that will automatically be a von Neumann algebra living on, on the Fox space. So the, what, what is second quantization here is this assignment which maps from real subspaces of H to operator algebras on the Fox space. And this has certain nice properties. Uh, what is rather clear is that when you enlarge the real space, you enlarge the operator algebra. But what is less clear is that uh, this map actually is injective. So uh, we really get an if and only if for this relation here. Now, it also translates the commutant on the level of the operator algebras to the symplectic orthogonal on the level of the real subspaces. So when you have a complex Hilbert space, the imaginary part of the scalar product is a symplectic form. And the symplectic orthogonal space of V, here denoted V prime, is what corresponds to the commutant. And geometrically, in, in physics, uh, this means causal complement for space-time domains, but I don't want to go into that too far. Okay, and the last relation that I have here is uh, the covariance. And here one has to say how the unitary group of the Hilbert space acts on Fox space, but this is uh, done in the natural way. Fox space is generated by products of vectors in the Hilbert space, and then unitary operators act uh, component-wise or factorize. Okay. Now, what is interesting now is to see which real subspaces create cyclic and separating uh, vectors for the von Neumann algebras. So the first observation is that for the vacuum vector to be cyclic for our operator algebra R of V, V has to be large in some sense. And large means that a V plus I times V should be a dense subspace. And we can likewise characterize subspaces for which omega is separating. This means that we should not be too large in some sense. And the precise relation is this one. So we should not contain any complex subspace, which is non-zero. And then the, the subspaces which are relevant for us here are those satisfying both conditions. They are called the, the standard subspaces and they are specified by these two relations. 
So standard means that omega is cyclic and separating for the von Neumann algebra R of V. And in particular, this means that uh, the Tomita Takesaki theorem applies. Um, so it produces this pair of operators, delta V, the modular operator, and JV, the modular conjugation. Uh, they satisfy this relation. And the standard subspace can be recovered as the fixed point space of this, as this product. You see, the, the S, this product, is precisely the complex conjugation of this complex space with respect to the real subspace V. And uh, this determines, in terms of polar decomposition, the two operators. OK. Now, in the Lie group context, this means that having in, in mind that we uh, can apply second quantization, what we can look at is a Lie group acting on a manifold, so a, a G space, a unitary representation. And then what we are after is a so called net of real subspaces. So this would be a family of closed real subspaces of H, uh, where O is, an, say, an open subset of our, of our G space. <clears throat> And this assignment, V of O, should satisfy the relations that uh, we see in quantum field theory. So it should be monotone in this sense. It should satisfy the appropriate covariance condition for the G action. And uh, what one would like to understand in this context in particular is for which families of this type can we have or can we see um, the regions for which these subspaces are standard. So these are hard to uh, construct. And what I will show you is how to find geometric configurations where this actually works. OK, now the next step is we want standard subspaces. And what I want to show you is how you can get these standard subspaces from representations of G directly. And what one has to represent in this context is not simply a group, but one needs a slightly refined structure. One needs pairs of groups, uh, where G is a larger group and G plus is a subgroup of index two. So the, the complement of this uh, subgroup is sort of the other half of the group. And uh, so one thinks of the group as consisting of even and odd elements. So the G plus is the even elements, and G minus the odd ones. So here are typical examples. <clears throat> now, if G is a Lie group which has two connected components, then you can always get a grading by taking as G plus the identity component. Typical example is the anti-unitary group of a Hilbert space. So it consists of all unitary and all anti-unitary operators. And then the even part is the unitary group, and the odd part are the anti-unitary operators. Now, a simpler geometric example is the projective uh, group of the, of the projective line. Um, so the projective line, real projective line, is the circle. <clears throat> and the Möbius transformations can be created by the uh, sign of the determinant. So PSL2R acts by orientation preserving maps on the circle. And uh, involutions like reflections, they act by reflections on the circle, which reverse the orientation. OK, another example important for physics is the proper Poincaré group. Um, so the, where I take the Lorentz group of uh, orientation preserving Lorentz um, transformations. This has two connected components. And the uh, connected components are separated according to their uh, behavior with respect to time orientation. So the uh, time orientation preserving maps will be the identity component. OK, so the typical structure you see in these examples 
is that the, the group G is a semi-direct product of G plus with a two element group and tau is an involution of G plus. So at least these are the, all the examples that will show up here have this structure. That's not always the case for two graded, for graded groups. Okay, so uh, what is an anti-unitary representation of a graded Lie group? Um, it's a homomorphism into the anti-unitary operators. And I want that G plus acts by unitary operators, um, G minus acts by anti-unitary operators, and one requires the typical continuity requirement, which means that the G action on H is continuous. Um, so given such an anti-unitary representation and the homogeneous space, we would like to see when we have nice nets of standard subspaces on this space. Okay, so suppose we have an anti-unitary representation, how can we get standard subspaces? And for that, there's an interesting direct construction which uh, goes as follows. So for every element in the Lie algebra, we look at the infinitesimal generator, partial u of x of the unitary one parameter group. So this is a screw joint operator on the Hilbert space. Uh, and the unitary one parameter group can be recovered by this formula in terms of functional calculus. Now, if our Lie group has this, uh, this structure and the element of the Lie algebra is fixed under this involution, then I can look at the following pair of operators. First of all, the image of the involution is a unitary, anti-unitary uh, involution, so called this J. And we also get a positive self-adjoint operator by this exponential. So here one has to watch out for this factor. So I times delta UH is uh, a self-adjoint operator and its exponent um, is positive. So um, because of this I here, we get this relation. So we have the relevant data for a standard subspace and we call the corresponding standard subspace V of U H tau because it depends on these three parameters. Uh, and that will be a standard subspace of H. And now we want to understand when is this subspace good for anything else? So can we use it to construct a certain net on a homogeneous space, etc. So to understand this, uh, we start by looking at the orbit of the standard subspace under the group, right? So uh, the group acts by the unitary representation on the set of all standard subspaces. We look at the orbit of V, that's a homogeneous space of the group. And having in mind that standard subspaces should correspond to domains in space time, um, it makes sense to uh, first look at those orbits for which the order, the inclusion order is non-trivial. And the inclusion order on this homogeneous space is encoded in the semi-group of all even elements of the group mapping the standard subspace into itself. So in a way, this is a compression semi-group of the type we have seen yesterday in, in Luis San Martin's talk but the environment is a little bit different. Okay, so we are now asking which of these triples are interesting. And interesting in our context now means that the semi-group should be large in some sense. Um, okay, so what should large mean? One way to express it is to say it should have interior points, but we need a little more and for that, we look at the set of infinitesimal generators, the Lie wedge of the semi-group. So this is, in the Lie algebra, the set of infinitesimal generators of one parameter sub semi-groups of SV. This is always a convex cone. And the condition we have in mind is that this convex cone should have interior points. So we, we should have many 
um, uh, infinitesimal generators. So for the theorem we want to formulate, we also need the so-called positive cone of the representation. I already said that these self-adjoint, these operators I get with this I factor here, they are self-adjoint. Um, so the so it's a natural condition to ask for these operators minus I delta U X to be positive in the sense of self-returned operators. Um, and it turns out that the set of these elements in the Lie algebra form a closed convex cone. And with this convex cone, we can now formulate our first uh, theorem. Um, of course, if one studies representations, one can always assume that their kernel is trivial or discrete. Um, because the kernel does nothing. So, um, well, looking at the situation here, the, the Lie algebra of the kernel consists of all elements which are uh, contained in this cone intersected with its negative. So having discrete kernel means that this cone CU is a pointed convex cone. <clears throat> okay, so if the semigroup is large, meaning that it's Lee which has interior points. Then it turns out that H has to be a very special element, and we call this an Euler element, namely that the Lie algebra uh, is a direct sum of three eigenspaces of H for the eigenvalues of one, zero, and minus one. So these are simply the eigenspaces for the bracket with, with H. <clears throat> So Euler elements are elements defining a three grading on the Lie algebra. And moreover, the involution also has to be determined by, by H in the sense that it should be e to the pi i at H, meaning that it acts by minus one on G one and G minus one and by one uh, on G zero. So um, we immediately get a very special situation now, conversely, we can then ask, if we have an Euler element, can we say what the semigroup is? And this actually works. So if we assume that H is an Euler element and that the involution acts like this on the Lie algebra, then we can intersect plus minus the positive cone with these grading spaces, G plus minus. So in G1, we take the positive elements, and G minus one, we take the negative elements. So we get two pointed convex cones. And with these two cones, we can form the semigroup as, or then the result is that the semigroup SV has such a product decomposition. So GV is the stabilizer group of the standard subspace. And then we have the exponential image of this pointed cone. One can also show that uh, one has a sort of threefold decomposition. So these things were studied by, by Khalid Koufani in, uh, uh, in Nancy. So he showed that uh, such polar decomposition for certain semigroups can also written like this. So this is not obvious because things are very non-commutative here. One simply cannot turn this plus into a product because the two subspaces don't commute. Okay, so the structure one finds for the Lie wedge is that in the one eigenspace, we have a pointed cone, C plus. We have the whole zero eigenspace and we have the minus in the minus eigenspace again, uh, a pointed cone. So this is a very, uh, explicit description of, of the semigroups. So time is flying. <clears throat> so uh, what we learn from that is we basically have to look at situations related to Euler elements and where the situation acts on the, the involution acts on the Lie algebra by this uh, uh, formula. And the interesting context is where these cone C plus minus generate the eigenspaces of H. So let us call this the positive energy condition because this is what it is in physics. 
So the next step is we want to understand how Euler elements can look like. So this is now something which is probably more familiar to the sort of control theory people here. So if we have a semi-simple Lie algebra, we look at the Cartan decomposition, K plus P. Then in P, we choose a maximal abelian subspaces. We get a restricted root system. Now here, sigma is my notation for the set of all roots, whereas uh, well, in, in Lewis and Martin's work, the sigma is the notation for the set of simple roots. Now for the simple roots, I can look at the dual basis, so I get a family of elements Hj. So on the, uh, the values of the simple roots will be zero and one, and the elements which are Euler elements are characterized by the property that all roots take only the values zero, one, and minus one. And um, well, looking at the tables for the root systems, one can now classify which of these elements are Euler elements. And one also knows that every Euler element in such a Lie algebra is conjugate to one of the HJ. So that's basic structure theory. So for the different types of root systems, we get this classification. So in our context, this was discussed in a paper with Vincenzo Morinelli that appeared a few months ago. Um, so maybe the picture for the Dynkin diagrams is more uh, memorable. So what you see here is for all those restricted root systems for which Euler elements exist, the red dots correspond to the basis for the simple roots um, for which the dual basis element Hj actually is an Euler element. So we have many for An and for the others, we may have one or, or three for type Dn, but there's nothing for Ea, G2, or F4. Okay. <clears throat> now, once we know that uh, Euler elements play an important role, we now want to look at homogeneous bases of the group and how we can construct um, nets of von Neumann algebras on these homogeneous bases. So what we consider here are symmetric spaces. So sigma will now be in involution on the, on the even part of the group. H will be the subgroup of fixed points for sigma. And M is the corresponding symmetric space. Now, what I assume is uh, that the Lie algebra contains a pointed generating invariant cone, which should correspond to the cone of positive elements of a unitary representation. And this cone should be flipped by uh, the involution in this sense. Uh, and I also want an Euler element which is fixed by the involution. Then I get this sort of quadruple. Um, so I have G, I have the involution. And this cone here is the involution, is the intersection with the minus one eigenspace of sigma, which is the tension space in the base point of the symmetric space. And also packing the H into this tuple, what I get is uh, called a modular because of H, compactly causal symmetric Lie algebra. And the compactly causal is uh, related to the type of cones that we get in the tension space here. Okay, so what can I do with that? The C is uh, a cone in the tension space of the base point, which is invariant under the stabilizer. So I can use it to get a cone field on the whole symmetric space. What I can also do is I can sort of complexify the symmetric space according to the causal structure so meaning that uh, I have the exponential function on the symmetric space. I take the image of i times the cone and I move this around with g. So what I get is 
something like a tube domain associated of the symmetric space. Okay, and what I also get is the candidate for the modular flow. So the action of the one parameter group generated by H on M is um, now we call the modular flow here. It's infinitesimal generated as a vector field on M. And what we also need is the fixed point space for this flow on M, uh, the fixed points for the modular flow. And with that data, I can specify three domains in M. And they will be the candidates for the uh, test regions in quantum field theory. So the first thing is the, the first domain is the positivity domain for the modular vector field. So I have this causal structure and I can look at all points where the vector field is pointing in, into this open cone. So in physics, this means it's time-like, so it's future point, pointing. Now, this other domain is a little more technical. Um, so I look at the fixed points for the modular flow. For every fixed point, the modular flow acts on the tension space. On the tension space, I have the three eigenspaces. And with these, I can construct analogs of the plus minus cones that we have seen for the semigroup. And then I'll take the symmetric space exponential image of this pointed cone, and I take the union of all these. So this a priori looks very different. And then I have a sort of uh, KMS wedge domain, which consists of all elements for which when I extend the modular flow analytically, to the imaginary interval between zero and i times pi, then this curve segment should be contained in this tube domain, in this complex manifold. So this specifies a certain set of elements in M. Um, so we have these three domains which look very different. And the main theorem of a paper with Gaston Olafsson that uh, we just finished is that for a reductive compactly causal symmetric space, so these that we constructed on the last slide, then all these domains coincide. So uh, that's very surprising when you see this for the first time. But the main point is this tells us that these domains are really interesting because they have so many different characterizations. <clears throat> and now to uh, sort of close the circle, um, if we have a unitary representation of such a group, um, then we want to construct on these symmetric spaces, G plus modulo H, covariant nets of standard subspaces, which are non-trivial in a certain sense. So what we ask for from the representation is that it's positive cone should be pointed and generating in the Lie algebra. So we should have many uh, elements with positive spectrum. That's the main point. And what we also need is, this is a little technical here, an H invariant distribution vector. So in basically this means uh, it's a representation which can be realized in a space of distributions on the homogeneous space G mod H. So uh, I don't want to go too much into that. Then uh, we get our uh, conjugation J from tau. We have already seen how to define this uh, standard subspace in terms of the Trinetti Guido Longo construction. But the main point here is that we can now write this as uh, a piece of a covariant net of standard subspaces uh, where this sort of straight V is this net and this is applied to this domain. And how does this work? Well, if we have a unitary representation U, we have an integrated representation. So for every 
test function on, on G+, we get an operator on the Hilbert space. Um, now, any distribution vector when hit with such operators becomes a real vector in the Hilbert space. And um, to a domain O in the symmetric space, I associate the real closed subspace, which is generated by these vectors, where phi is a test function with the property that if I project its support to the symmetric space, it's contained in O. So this construction works very generally and always produces a covariant net of real subspaces. But the tricky point here is that um, at least some of the uh, subspaces should be actually standard and not just any closed real subspace of the Hilbert space. So this is uh, bringing us full circle in a way. Typical examples are uh, the group case where M is just a group, where G times G acts from left and right. Then the wedge domain uh, turns out to be a so-called real Olchansky semi-group in the group. And the example most relevant for physics in this uh, class of spaces is so-called anti-de Sitter space, which is a quadric corresponding to signature two comma say d minus one, if you like. And the group is then the uh, conformal group of Minkowski space, one dimension lower. So my time is roughly up. Let me just show you one slide with a classification of these symmetric spaces that we encounter here. So the, these compactly causal symmetric spaces, they occur in four series. Um, one series is the group type, so where the manifold actually is a group. And the corresponding Lie algebras are listed here. They are the so-called Hermitian Lie algebras of tube type. Now, then there are the Cayley type spaces. They are obtained from these Lie algebras uh, by uh, adding a certain involution, which is speci specified by an Euler element. So they are listed here. Again, it's four infinite series and one exceptional type. So the example which is most relevant for physics is this one, because the group SO2D is the conformal group of Minkowski space. And this is the one uh, for which the uh, symmetric space is Lorentzian. And that's the geometric structure that we like to have for uh, classical space times. And then there are some other series um, which are listed in the tables here. And they are distinguished by the property that the involution is no longer the one coming from the Euler element. And then one uh, has the two series distinguished by the rank conditions on the fixed point spaces. OK, and I think I uh, stop here. Thank you. So I hope the slides were well visible. Sorry. <laughs> uh, wow. <laughs> Did you say something, uh, Karhaman? No. Uh, so, sorry, I was only asking if the slides were well visible, but some people were ah, not. Okay. No, no, <laughs> okay. they were very fine. <laughs> well, I could read, and my eyes are not any more good. <laughs> 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 uh, any questions? Uh, well, uh, uh, no. Daniel, Daniel, I don't know how you pronounce in English. We would pronounce Daniel. Yes, because it's a, it's <laughs> uh, a Latin language. Yeah, Daniel, yes, it's a, uh, a common name for us too. 
Daniel uh, Rage. I just wondered uh, in um, since uh, in Hagerup's theory of uh, standard forms, uh, there is a self-dual cone in the Hilbert space that uh, mm -hmm. plays a crucial role. Does it show up in your uh, geometric construction that uh, self-dual cone? Um, well, not so much. I mean, you see, it's it's very much hidden in the background. I mean, the uh, the condition that you have. Um, the cyclic separating vector means that your realization of the von Neumann algebra is the standard form realization. So this space contains uh, the cone. Um, I, I think the, the natural cone is more involved in um, modifying the second quantization process. Right? So say when, when you have a geometric situation and you can uh, start with an anti-unitary re representation of a Lie group, uh, then you get this uh, family of standard subspaces in a Hilbert space. And then applying second quantization is just a free construction. So this is what produces free quantum field theories. No interaction. Oh, okay. um, and, and if you want to uh, do finer things where you really put physics into these constructions, uh, then what you typically move, you uh, replace the state that you get from, from omega in the Fox space by a different state in the natural cone. Right? So the natural cone basically consists of or, or is generated by states of the von Neumann algebra, which are uh cyclic and, and separating and then moving these states this means um fine-tuning the the physics of the model but but this is way beyond what you can reach from the geometry here i mean then you need final constructions okay thank you welcome More questions? Well, there are no. But I, let let me let me uh, make a very general question, which uh, maybe it's uh, maybe it's awful. To, <laughs> to, uh, uh, it, it, there is any 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 perspective of doing this kind of construction on. Uh, based on more general semigroups than those in in a in a affine in a, in a causal symmetric spaces, or, or what is the 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 what what is the possibility of uh, doing constructing something like that? Um, I, I think you can still see my slides, right? Mm, yes, yes, yes. It's, uh... oh, okay. Um, so let me go back to where I had this semi group. Right. So when when you look here on this structure theorem, this yeah. tells you that whenever you are in a situation and you have a standard subspace, uh, in particular, standard subspaces coming from von Neumann algebras, then the semi-groups that show up there will always be of this type, right? So, I mean, up to very degenerate situations where the uh, semi-group is not generated by its Lie wedge, et cetera. But if it's generated by its Lie wedge, um, then the Lie wedge will always have to be of this kind. So, so this means that as long as you want semi-groups in the picture, um, the, the semi-groups have to be of this kind, right? So, so they always come from three gradings, etc. But there are many. I mean, the, the point is when you restrict to reductive groups, you cut away many mixed, more complicated situations. So there are also mixed groups which are not reductive, etc. But, but uh, uh, 
sorry uh, but 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 maybe this is because this this uh, uh very rigid uh, structure comes from the fact that you are insisting to define operators uh, uh, well a group of operators given by the exponential of uh, this uh this h of this Euler element uh, um Yeah, I mean, there are two ways you can go from here, right? I mean, one is you could give up the assumption that the group is finite dimensional. <laughs> no, um, no, I don't know. Yeah. <clears throat> which, which makes sense here because all this fine structure theory and the fact that you get Euler elements and all that, uh, this depends very heavily on the assumption that your symmetry group is finite dimensional. And there are many infinite dimensional examples where you have much greater variety, which is much harder to, to classify somehow. But what, what ex, what's actually more interesting for physics are the situations where you don't really have a semigroup at all, namely where the domains in your symmetric space are such that they are not sitting in each other. Okay. Uh, so there is the sitter space where the test regions can easily be described, but when you have two test regions, uh, there's never one sitting in the, in the other. So the semi-group is trivial. And if you give up, give up on the semi-group, then the game is free again, right? Then it's not so clear what the age and the delta can be and all that. So this is only in the situation which in physics correspond to positive energy representations and where you want uh, families of domains which you can squeeze into each other by symmetries. So when you want this kind of self-similarity, then this is the only way you have, having three gradings and the corresponding semigroups. Fine, fine, thank you. <laughs> Any more questions? So let's let's thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Carhaman again. Thank you very much, Carhaman.